All right, welcome everyone to our seminar and um, thank you for joining us. I would like to invite you all to the seminar where we'll be launching our report. Setse has launched a new report on improving access to, to the GCF and to, we would like to discuss about ways where we can um, improve access to the GCF. Thank you for coming to this session and I hope that is all well with you and your family. We are all concerned about how CSOs or civil society can access the GCF, especially in the context of increasing climate change impacts across the globe. And with limited access and experience in accessing the GCF, it's easy to be overwhelmed and to be discouraged. And so we thought in this session, it will help us to achieve clarity on what is possible and how CSOs could be inspired to work together in improving access to the GCF. So before we do get started, I would like to start with some housekeeping rules to ensure that uh, this webinar works smoothly as a success. You will notice that for today's agenda, uh, we are going to have a keynote speaker uh, presentation at the beginning. Then that session will be followed by a panelist, a, a, a list of panelists who will be able to share their experience and comments on this report. And then later on, we are going to dedicate enough time for you to ask questions based on what you have heard before. And I would like to let you know that once, a, once again, the purpose of this web, web, webinar is to inform CSOs, anybody who's interested, especially small organizations like sister members uh, and partners in this Global South about this new research and to collect your feedback. So SITSE is a family of uh, Catholic development um, based in Brussels, but uh, situated across uh, the globe. So before I really would like to, uh, without saying uh, too much, I would like us to uh, keep track of this housekeeping rules. First of all, you will realize that your mic is disabled but we would like to collect all the, your feedback, your comments throughout this session. So as the presenter make their intervention, you are invited to, to, to type in this following website, www.menti.com, or uh, use a cell phone to, to connect to the website using the, the QR code that I will show you very shortly and make sure that you type in this number that you see on your screen. So when you make your intervention or you ask your question, please write your name, then in the name of the, the speaker which you like to direct this question to and this question. For example, you can say Lydia from Sitse to Thomas, and then you pose your question. Please keep your questions concise. And also for the interpretation purposes, Please use the globe on the bottom right side of your screen. There are translations available in English, French, and Spanish. So please, if you have any technical issues, use the chats to just let us know if you're struggling with using the interpretation function. So uh, once again, to ask your question, I would like you to use Mentimeter throughout the chat, I, uh, throughout this, inter uh, inter uh, this session, and I'll also be sending the, this link to, to, for you in the chat so that you do not forget. 
Without wasting any further time, it is my pleasure to introduce the speakers for today. And on the panel today, our keynote speaker, we have Mr. Thomas Hirsch. He is the founding director of the International Consultancy of the Climate and Development Advice, and he's based in Germany. Uh, before he served in leading positions in the Bread for the World and international NGOs, he holds a diploma in geography at the University of Heidelberg. But what's so important before founding the Climate and Development Advice, Thomas served amongst others as a development policy representative of Germany, the German Development and Humanitarian Aid Agency, Bread for the World, as finance director of the human rights organization and trade policy campaigner of Greenpeace and a lecturer at the Kolsu Institute for Technology. Welcome, uh, Thomas. I would also like to go on to an, uh, another uh, panelist who is Leah Achampong. Achampong, sorry. <laughs> she is a senior policy and ad advocacy advisor at Eurodebt, leading the climate finance uh, office. Leah joined Eurodebt in April 2020 to start up a Eurodebt's policy work and research on climate finance, which includes in, uh, building a, a, network capacity uh, to work on climate finance. So she began working on climate change issues uh, since 2001 on policy, advocacy, coordination and communications and arranging events. Before that, she worked for WWF European Policy Office for over four years. And she also worked at a Climate Action Network Europe campaign against climate change and environmental investment organization. She holds a master's in sustainability science and policy from Matric, Matric University. The next on the panel is Julius Ngoma. Julius is a national coordinator for civil society network on climate change in Malawi since 2014. He represents a, a, this a network at national level by serving in the joint national technical committee on climate change and disaster risk management in Malawi. And he's an, also an expert, is a part of the expert working group on adaptation in Malawi, also a member, a core team member of, for the development and national adaptation plan in Malawi and many, many, many more. So Mr. Julius Ngoma holds an MSc in environmental sciences from University of Malawi and a Bachelor of Science in forestry from Zuzu University in Malawi. Finally, but not least, is Raju uh, Shetri, is the executive director of Patriki Resource Center, or also short for PRC, an environment and development organization based in Kathmandu in Nepal. He has 15 years of experience in the area of climate change policy processes and sustainable development. He focuses his work mainly on climate change policy and climate finance issue. Raju also closely follows international climate change negotiations under the UNFCCC and the Green Climate Fund. That is our panel. I hope you get a sense of how, uh, who will be speaking and also how we're going to uh, be able to respond to, uh, to your question. At the moment, I would like to give the floor to Thomas, um, in, uh, for Thomas to, give us his presentation, just for a moment. So while we are waiting for the presentation, thank you very much for that warm welcome, Lydia. And um, hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to all of us. It's my pleasure to present in the next 12, 13 minutes, um, the key findings and conclusions of this study that was already introduced by Lydia. Um, I guess you can see it. Maybe you can change to full screen. Perfect. Very good. And maybe already the next slide. So I served as um, the key author of that study. Um, 
I was tasked by Sitzer to um, do a combined research, desk research combined with um, evidence-based case analysis um, to look a little bit more into the GCF. Of course, the GCF, that's a wide field and we had a quite um, concrete and sharp focus on the question of access to, this, uh, to the GCF for civil society organizations. So my presentation is structured as follows. I will briefly introduce the purpose of the study and um, the research approach we have taken. I will then um, present the structure of the study, some key facts on the GCF for those of us who are not so familiar with GCF. And then I will um, come to the conclusions in how far and why um, CSO access to the GCF is in fact limited. What are arising policy demands to enhance access and what are the concluding recommendations to SITSA and also other civil society organizations? Next slide, please. So, as I said, the purpose of the study, explore GCF funding opportunities for civil society organizations and the barriers that exist. Um, the underlying assumption of SITSA is that the involvement of civil society organizations is absolutely key to um, implement the Paris Agreement or the commitments, goals of the Paris Agreement, well aligned with the SDGs. To do that, you need a whole of society approach in implementation. Civil society is a key part of society and therefore they have to contribute. But to contribute, they of course need to access climate finance. Next slide. There are three guiding questions for this report. The first one is the question for the key eligibility criteria, the entry points, success factors, barriers, technical barriers, and risks to access GCF climate finance for CSOs. The second question is the question, if small CSOs, including community-based organizations, which form a considerable part of the network, partner network of SITSA, can also benefit from the GCF. And then if so, how? And if they cannot benefit directly from GCF, how could the GCF be advocated to open funding windows for smaller civil society organizations in future as well? Next slide. The research approach is a twin track approach. We decided to combine desk work. That means um, analyzing GCF policies and guidelines that are relevant in view of the research questions with um, the assessment of concrete cases. So to have an evidence-based part in the research approach as well. We selected 20 out of the roundabout 70 GCF policies and guidelines as being relevant for our research questions. And we gathered information from altogether six concrete cases, um, having interviews with international civil society organizations, with national CSOs from a number of countries, Bangladesh, Denmark, Germany, India, Nepal, Malawi, but also we had a number of interviews with, um, with former and current GCF board members, advisors, um, member or people working with um, NDAs um, and national implementing entities in a number of countries as well. We compared the results from the both work streams, from the policy analysis and the evidence-based cases. And that led us to a number of conclusions, policy demands and recommendations. Next slide, please. The structure of the report, I think 37 pages altogether. Um, we have an executive summary, an introduction. The chapter one provides some key facts on the GCF. 
to provide the broader framework. Chapter two is dedicated to the um, desk study part. We analyzed uh, the GCF policies and guidelines on three major issues. Number one is CSO participation in GCF policy making, national and international level. Number two is CSO accreditation as an implementing entity. So to say, to become a partner, not only to serve as an observer. And number three is CSO access to funding, project funding and other funding. Chapter three combines the lessons learned from the case studies. Again, on the number of um, selected topics, number one is CSO observer participation. Second one is accreditation as an implementing entity. Third one is engagement in country programming. Next one is engagement in GCF readiness and um, national adaptation planning support programs. And then we had uh, two analysis of um, organizations that uh, successfully or unsuccessfully tried to access GCF funding. And uh, the final part are the conclusions and policy recommendations. Next one, please. Some key facts on the GCF for those who are not so familiar with GCF. GCF is the flagship of climate finance institutions. It's the biggest fund and it's the most prominent, most well-known fund. It was established under the decision of the Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in the year 2010 in Mexico, Cancun at COP16. The main or the main mandate is to promote the paradigm shift towards low emission and climate resilient development pathways by providing support to developing countries. In order to do so, the fund pursues to achieve a number of things, but most importantly, a balanced fund allocation, 50%, 50% between climate mitigation, greenhouse gas emission, and adaptation. It has a, speci a special focus on the adaptation needs of particularly vulnerable countries. It um, recognizes, this is part of the DNA of, um, just a second, um, part of the DNA of the fund, it um, puts a lot of emphasis on um, country ownership of the support provided by GCF. It uses a broad range of financial products, grants, the biggest part, 44% by the end of 2020 of all the funds, concessional loans, second most important part, and then in minor degree, um, other instruments like guarantees, equity, and others. It is governed by a board with a balanced representation of Global South and North. And it had approved by the end of 2020, 159 projects with a total volume or value of 23.4 billion US dollar, out of which 7.6 or so were contributions met by the fund. 154 countries are formally eligible for funding. The fund had by the end of last year, 103 accredited entities eligible to apply, including only six civil society organizations. This is about 5.5%. 5, 5 this is, I read them because they are so few. Conservation International, so far one project, IUCN, five projects, WWF, one project, Save the Children, one project, and then two national actors, Fundación Alvina, Panama, one project, and uh, the youngest member, and so far without project, National Trust for Nature Conservation from Nepal. 6% or less than 6% of the accredited entities, the partners of the fund, CSOs, while at the level of observers, there is um, a high representation. 65% of all observers are NGOs, altogether 296. 
Next slide. The conclusions, the key conclusions. First, let us look um, on the question to serve as an observer to the GCF board meetings or to observe and take part at national level in GCF in-country activities. And that is country programming and map development and others. As observers to GCF board meetings, CSOs are well represented. And what they do being observers is first and foremost, they do lobby work and their key lobby demands, the priorities are quite similar to the key priorities, current ones of small island developing states, least developed countries, African countries. That is for example, um, simpli simplified approval of projects or direct access, better direct access. What CSOs serving as observers do not follow as a priority is to lobby for better access of CSOs to, C, uh, to GCF funding. So lobbying for the demands of civil society organizations who want to become partners to the fund is not yet a lobby priority. And it's also not currently at least a high relevance for GCF board members. There is at the national level, there is overarching agreement that um, CSOs contribute to make GCF country programs, readiness and NAP support programs more ambitious and more vulnerability focused. And that this contribution is significant. That is almost consensus. But whether CSOs can perform in that role very much depends on the national circumstances. And that means on the room or the space provided by national governments. And in many countries, CSO inclusion and participation is very weak at the country level. And the GCF board and secretariat, according to interviewees, is not doing enough to improve CSO participation in national GCF country programs, despite the fact that this is according to the statutes of the guidelines a priority. Next one. Uh, Martin, uh, uh, Thomas, you only have two minutes. Okay, thank you. CSOs have limited access to GCF funding. They are number one, disadvantaged to become accredited implementing entities because of the fact that the accreditation process is complex, is costly and is long. And GCF is not doing enough to enable CSO accreditation, despite the fact that there is a high demand from CSOs, particularly uh, from the Global South to become accredited. And so to say, in order to provide access for community-based organizations to climate finance and by becoming that, helping to reform the GCF from inside by good practice. And good practice would mean ambitious and people-centered projects. So the technical hurdles are too high. The next step, once you are accredited, um, is the question whether you can access GCF climate finance easily. And here again, uh, the results of the study or the, the research we did show that there are high technical and organizational barriers. Country drivenness and the no objection approach is a significant filter that means if the government has an objection and say, no, we don't want to see that uh, CSO uh, project being presented to the GCF, there is no chance. But apart from that, there are also a number of technical and financial barriers, which we can then discuss a little bit more in the discussion. On the other hand, there are some special opportunities too. It is obvious that there is a rising demand for community-based adaptation projects. 
And for these projects, CSOs are considered to be particularly competent. So there is demand for, for CSO competence at that front. Altogether, we come to the conclusion that it is easier for CSOs to access funds, not as a direct partner to the GCF implementing entity, but by becoming an executing entity, working together with an implementing entity in the respective country. Altogether, we can say the chances for CSOs to get project proposals approved as executor or implementer are high if the proposals are of high quality, if they very, very well reflect the unique selling point of the, of the particular applicant, and if they match priorities of the implementing entity, the national designated authority, and as well main selection criteria of the GCF. Next one. What are policy demands that could be raised to enhance CSO access? Number one, we propose that the GCF, in order to provide a more enabling framework for CSOs, should set up simplified access to funding for CSOs or community-based organizations. And that could be the creation of a funding window specifically for CSOs. And since we have as a precedence in the private sector, the so-called private sector facility, we propose to set up a small grant facility for CSOs as their own funding window. Secondly, the GCF should simplify the accreditation for CSOs as implementing entity. CSOs are different from banks, and therefore you should distinguish when you talk about accreditation standards, depending if you speak uh, with a CSO or a bank or another actor. Third, GS GSF should ensure appropriate participation of CSOs in country programming that works well in some countries, but it doesn't work well in others, as I said. And finally, uh, the GCF should be more um, responsive to CSO's expectations with regard to the GCF readiness and NAP support programs. Next slide. We have some recommendations to CSOs like SITSA and others. Number one, we recommend um, when it comes to lobbying GCF for a more enabling framework for CSOs, we recommend that CSOs and in particular such CSO networks who have close ties in both Global North and South should start or facilitate a strategic, a strategic dialogue between CSOs on the question what to expect from the GCF in terms of providing climate finance. And the results of such a dialogue could then inform the future lobby agenda of those CSOs who serve as observers to the GCF board. Secondly, building enhanced awareness among CSOs about the GCF um, by providing capacity building support to better understand what are the GCF modalities the GCF by name is the most known climate fund. But if you talk to many CSOs, uh, the in-depth knowledge and understanding of this fund is still in many cases relatively weak. And there CSOs like SITSE can provide capacity building support, which would then um, empower CSOs to better understand the modalities and to try to influence them. Next one. Thirdly, we, um, with regard to supporting local partners to take part in GCF readiness and NAP support programs, we suggest to networks like SITSE that you should support your local partners to contribute to these programs at national levels, and that is a matter of finance in, in many cases. And next one is 
that you also support your local partners to develop GCF funding proposals as executing entities, for example. We all know that it is time consuming and costly to develop um, a proposal that is fit for purpose with the GCF. There are so many CSOs who want to develop such proposals, but there is a lack of human technical and financial resources. And that is an area where SITS and other networks can support the local partners in the global south. Next one. Then there is the question whether SITSA members or other big CSOs should become or apply to become implementing entities on their own. And that is a quite strategic question. And here we suggest, we suggest to take three steps. First, to discuss in your own organization what would be your expectations and the motivation to become an implementing entity. What is the benefit for you, but also for your Southern partners? Once this is clear, the next step you should do is to assess your own capacities and to carry out a gap analysis in view of the GCF requirements and accreditation criteria. And here the self-assessment tool provided by GCF is helpful. And the third step would then be to undertake a longer term cost benefit analysis, incorporating all the cost estimations for accreditation, re-accreditation, acting as an, um, as an implementing entity and developing projects. And only if you have run through these three steps, you can, you can take an informed decision whether it makes sense for you to apply or not to apply. And the next one I think is the last one. And that is to say, thank you very much for your attention. If you have more questions on the study, you can either contact me or you contact sits directly. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Thomas, uh, for your uh, very incredible and insightful uh, presentation. Um, I think many organizations like SITSA as a development organization are now receiving this information and um, they are actually what I'm taking from some of the key points that you're talking about is the role that civil society, especially small organization, can play in terms of bringing transformation and ambition on the ground. And um, I would like to call on the next panelist uh, to give a reflection on some of the insights that we've heard, the recommendations, and some of the policy asks based on uh, maybe the experience um, to engage in the discussion. Leah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lydia, and thank you, Thomas. Um, I was asked to present the findings from a recent Eurodad report that outlines six lessons on development finance that are relevant for understanding how to strengthen climate finance as a tool for supporting sustainable development. Many of these findings echo what Thomas has already shared on civil society engagement and participation, access to finance and uh, group dynamics. Um, as we all know, the cost of climate action is variable and not stable and is dependent on specific country circumstances, including because of the variability of shocks, meaning that countries can face the same or another extreme climatic event within a very short time frame, And as such, costs are also variable. As such, it's imperative that developing countries have, um, climate vulnerable countries have access to a predictable and stable stream of climate finance in order to determine and react to their contingent liability for extreme climatic events. So coming back to the recent Eurodad report, there are six lessons that I think um, are useful and that echo what Thomas has, has already shared. Um, one is that instrumentalizing policies for other interests, including the interests of countries and multinational corporations does not allow for, the, for climate vulnerable countries to have ownership or enable democratic country-driven strategies. The second is that 
private sector involvement can be costlier than public service investments and can additionally lead to unplanned elasticity costs. Third, export driven approaches, meaning strategies that focus on using international trade as a growth strategy to achieve economic development to sustainable development have intensified an over-reliance on certain industries to support entire economies. Fourth, the economic prowess of certain richer countries influences countries' macroeconomic policies, particularly with regard to production choices of low and or middle income countries. Fifth, the involvement of public development banks does not automatically lead to positive development outcomes, despite their mandate being to serve the public good. And sixth, group dynamics play a significant role in project development and implementation. Going forwards, there are six recommendations useful for enhancing the quality, quantity and composition of climate finance in order to enable vulnerable countries and communities to address ongoing losses and damages, to adapt to climate change and to become core members of the renewable energy transition. These six recommendations are that there needs to be strong and own democratic country ownership of climate finance strategies that are based on the needs of those in the country and vulnerable communities. Second, there needs to be public climate finance needs to be in the form of grants. Data from the, from the OECD, the Organization of Economic Development Organization uh, and Development, sorry, <laughs> um, has shown that the, the majority of climate finance is currently provided in the form of loans, most of which comes from private finance. Um, Third, there needs to be greater access to climate finance in order to minimise debt. Something that, was, that is very evident is that there is both climate induced debt as well as debt induced climate impacts on, on a country and vulnerability on a country. Uh, however, but by granting greater access to climate finance, this does help to minimise the, the, the debt um, levels of a, of a vulnerable country. Fourth, countries increase, um, need to increase finance for adaptation and to address ongoing losses and damages. This is a, a point of um, contention within UNFCCC processes is that there currently is no um, dedicated stream of finance to address loss and damage. And additionally, adaptation finance is severely underfunded. Whilst we've seen some interesting developments in the last few weeks coming from some of the richer countries on adaptation finance. What it shows is that adaptation finance is still severely underfunded and there is, is nothing for um, post loss and damage finance. Fifth, uh, climate finance must be gender responsive and there needs to be greater structures put in place to um, provide finance to women-led organisations. Climate, climate change impacts people in communities in differing ways and there's a need to ensure that the, the additional burden caused of, of climate action is not disproportionately um, felt by, by young girls moving up into womanhood. And so there is a need for climate finance to be gender responsive and for finance to be going towards women-led organizations. Um, and sixth, countries should also institutionalize engagement and participation processes. And that is because Differing parts of, of a society have differing levels of access to finance and differing levels of power within a society. Um, there are a lot of indigenous organisations that don't necessarily have the same amount of access to their public administrations and as such their, their interests are not always adequately reflected within the policies and projects that are developed and implemented. So there was a need to put in place institutional engagement and participation process to ensure that all members in society are included within the, the process of project and policy development and implementation. I realise that I've just given you the headline points, but I'm looking forward to discussing these findings and recommendations with you more during the discussion. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Leah. And I really, you, you've just added, in addition to what Thomas has said, I heard you talk about the quality, you talk about the quantity. And right now I would like to invite uh, Julius, you know, because we hear about all these challenges and they, we still hear that there's greater need for access to the GCF. Uh, Julius, can you please give us your experience as a small uh, organization who tried to access Share us a little bit of an experience. Can you relate with some of the things that we hear today? Over to you, Julius. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, and thank you for inviting me. And i um, very pleased to have contributed to this work as well. Um, um, uh, but uh, let me go straight into um, our experience, uh, because I acknowledge the fact that most of the information has been shared by Thomas, and then uh, I actually uh, want to agree with the information that has been shared, um, and um, uh, probably uh, most importantly on the information that is actually relating to uh, how the civil society have been, you know, bad or have had a bad experience in terms of accessing uh, GCF uh, resources, but also being part and parcel of different uh, processes that the GCF uh, has set up uh, for for different uh, stakeholders. So, and uh, just just as uh, like other many other countries in the uh, global south, uh, Malawi has uh, uh, was privileged to uh, maybe um, uh, um, access uh, resources from the GCF. Um, um, uh, similarly with other countries, um, maybe sim not many other countries in the global south, uh, uh, Malawi has also been in the, uh, you know, um, privileged to access um, the $3 million uh, uh, GCF, um, you know, uh, readiness funding uh, 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 that is used to support the national adaptation uh, uh, planning process, uh, but also um, uh, has been, um, uh, a privilege to also access the readiness, um, uh, which is up to 500, uh, 300 or 500 US dollars, uh, uh, 500,000 US dollars, uh, but also has uh, engaged in a number of processes like many other global, uh, you know, Southern uh, countries uh, to, you know, uh, develop their country strategic uh, frameworks, but also uh, go, uh, go through their own processes to develop uh, uh, GCF country protocols. Why am I sh sharing all this? Uh, is just to give you a context that um, um, uh, since uh, 2015, when the GCF was actually established and they started working, uh, Malawi uh, was uh, also in the forefront to be, you know, uh, uh, sub, uh, getting, you know, getting into the processes of different of GCF. Uh, um, um, and maybe even the civil society were getting prepared. Um, uh, to play different roles uh, at, at national level, but also at international level to, to either access the resources or uh, maybe uh, becoming um, 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 some of the civil society organizations becoming uh, NIEs um, or, or maybe becoming uh, uh, executing entities, but also trying to play different roles uh, at national level. But uh, as Thomas has indicated, um, um, you know, um, playing uh, the, the the field has not been leveled um, at, for us as civil society. For example, in the uh, in Malawi, to um, uh, play our roles and also access uh, resources that uh, uh, you know sitting at the GCF. Um, I can uh, confidently say that uh, within the um, the last five years, um, civil society in Malawi have played uh, different roles, um, um, uh, making sure that our country programming processes have uh, actually been uh, developed with voices from civil society demands. But uh, this has not been an easy uh, process because the, the political landscape, uh, the political will from the institutions that were uh, you know, uh, developed to govern GCF, uh, GCF processes in the country have not been open enough. Uh, so uh, we have been limited in terms of how we can interact with the processes, but also uh, uh, providing input in different uh, uh, national level development processes. Uh, but we've also been able to, uh, as, as civil society, but also as CISONEC, uh, worked uh, together uh, with um, uh, different 
uh, organizations to develop and prepare concept notes, proposals. As Thomas has indicated, this has always been a very difficult task because of lack of uh, funding uh, and also technical expertise from uh, uh, the different uh, players in the civil society to make sure that our proposals go through the, uh, the stages where and also accepted by uh, different you know, stages of the uh, uh, proposal development processes. Uh, but you, as you, Thomas has also indicated, the, the process have always been uh, rigorous, requiring a lot of uh, fi financial resources. Uh, and this has always been uh, something that uh, uh, has barred civil society from taking their, their, their role in terms of uh, also becoming uh, implementing um, uh, agencies. Uh, but just also agree with uh, what uh, Thomas has indicated. As civil society, uh, I think we, um, uh, in the last five years, we've tried to play a role of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, trying to, to, to be one of the implementing uh, entities. Uh, and um, we've seen uh, four institutions in the country uh, that are from the civil society trying to express their uh, interest to, to become accredited entities, uh, national, uh, accredited, national implementing entities. Uh, but um, along the way, I think uh, we, with so many difficulties in terms of the accreditation processes, but also the requirements and so on and so forth, uh, we've seen uh, 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 the number of uh, you know, civil society organizations in the country uh, that are expressing to, be, uh, uh, um, to become accredited entities uh, reducing and uh, at the moment uh, from four in 2015 uh, we are we are remaining with one institution which is leadership for environment and development which is actually still pursuing to become an accredited entity whether this is going to happen or not is something that we're going to learn and um, uh, until the end of the process so uh, that strengthens the point that Trump Thomas was actually uh, indicated that maybe in the short term uh, we could see uh, more of the, um, um, you know, um, civil society organization playing a role of uh, executing entities. Uh, we have seen already uh, for the last two years uh, in Malawi, civil society organizations are coming together, uh, build coalitions, uh, um, uh, partnerships to actually um, uh, develop proposals and uh, submit together. But what one thing that has always been a, a challenge is to find an accredited entity, which is uh, for us at, the, at our disposal, it's always international uh, accredited entities, which have also their own, you know, uh, priorities, but also have their own, uh, you know, um, a, a objectives in terms of how they want to be engaging with the GCF processes, and they have their own demands uh, towards the, the local NGO. So this has also been a very uh, difficult task for, for civil society, especially the local ones, to actually still engage in the processes. And we've tried as civil society uh, organizations to become uh, delivery partners for different uh, processes. For example, the readiness that I mentioned in my, uh, in, uh, at the beginning, uh, the readiness um, a, a support, uh, where um, uh, even civil society organizations in the countries, uh, in the global south, in a country, can express to be one of those delivery partners, but uh, there, there's always black out, black out of information. For example, from our from our colleagues who have been managing these processes, to open up the processes uh, in terms of also uh, making it possible that civil society uh, um, in Malawi can also be can also play that role. So we always find that other partners we, who are mostly the development partners, UNDP and others have already taken up the. The, uh, the, the, the roles and leaving out the civil society not uh, playing uh, the, the role that they can also play. So uh, in so doing, uh, we've, we've, um, we've not been able to access uh, um, uh, directly uh, a civil society, uh, the resources from GCF, but uh, suffice to say that there are still opportunities that we can uh, uh, still uh, play uh, uh, those roles as uh, a civil society, for example, um, um, I, I would outline some of the, the, the activities that we can do that are also in line with what Thomas and uh, my other colleague have already mentioned. We still want to build the capacities of the national and local actors at, uh, on the GCF in order to strengthen uh, their understanding uh, on the different modalities and also make sure that they, they position themselves in a way that they can play the different roles in the processes. Uh, uh, that are related to GCF. 
uh, we also want to encourage uh, the, uh, the civil society organizations to do collaborations and partnerships more so that at least uh, when it comes to proposal development, where resources, for example, technical expertise uh, are lacking, uh, coming together will help us to actually uh, position ourselves to become the executive entities that uh, Thomas was actually uh, uh, mentioning. And also even uh, in, um, uh, being delivery partners to some of the, uh, the processes that we are going to be engaging as a, a, at, at national level. So uh, in, um, also, uh, finally, I would also say that um, uh, I, I am actually agreeing with what Thomas indicated in terms of the, uh, the recommendations. We need simplified accreditation processes for civil society to become NIEs. We need uh, the GCF specific CSO window so that that can facilitate easy access to GCF resources because uh, local NGOs cannot be competing with international and even uh, other development partners which uh, have more of their capacity in terms of uh, so many areas that uh, uh, they can be able to access the resources. But also we need to work on uh, uh, making sure that our countries have uh, effective stakeholder engagement strategies uh, um, uh, by the NDAs to ensure that there's effective engagement, CSOs can contribute to different processes and also represent uh, 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 the, the communities uh, so well uh, in the processes. And finally, also uh, there's need for proper mechanisms for civil societies to benefit from readiness and project preparatory support facilities. Uh, uh, as I mentioned in the country, uh, there's, uh, these kind of facilitations are far from you know, supporting civil society organizations directly uh, because uh, the, the process have not been opened up. So we, we only, uh, hear about uh, these uh, prepare, I mean, support systems, but they're not uh, actually benefiting uh, uh, really uh, the, the civil society on the ground. So let me stop there and I can share more if, uh, if need be. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Julius. And we did hear about the struggles that CSOs experience when they want to become uh, accredited entities and some of the recommendations to lobby the GCF to become more, uh, to have a more enabling framework to benefit CSOs. Now I'd like to ask Raju, from a policy perspective, with all this that you hear and with the possible recommendations and how to in engage the GSO, what is your take on this? Thank you, uh, Lydia, and uh, um, also to Sitsi for inviting me to this uh, seminar. Uh, namaste to everyone from Kathmandu. Good to see you all. Well, I think my job has been very easy now because uh, Thomas, thank you very much. You did an excellent uh, job by uh, presenting your paper. I think there are a lot of things that I wanted to share have already been captured there. Similarly, uh, Leah and also Julius uh, mentioned quite a lot of things that I would have already said. Uh, let me just highlight uh, some of the things and I've given, given uh, 10 minutes. So let me just stick uh, within that time. Well, for uh, all the developing countries, uh, climate, uh, Green Climate Fund is seen as a very, uh, one of the major bodies that will really finance climate actions in countries like ours, you know, whether it's for mitigation actions or for climate adaptation actions. And there's a lot of these expectations that the money would go there, it would come to countries and we'd all you know, access a lot of money to do this and then um, you know, we'll solve our problems kind of. But uh, in practice, that has been very, very uh, frustrating for many countries, even for bigger organizations with uh, countries with ability to access resources has been you know, extremely difficult. It's, it's highly technical process. You know, it's uh, understanding the whole mechanism of how it um, you know, functions has been, uh, been challenging for many of the uh, countries, uh, including Nepal, because the kind of process that uh, GCF really employs is not a, a very easy and you know, smooth uh, process. There are a lot of technic technicalities around it. Even those international organizations who acted it with the GCF and tried to access funds, even for them, it has been extremely com complicated. Now, when those international org organizations uh, are you know, facing the challenges, just imagine even the national government organization in country like Nepal or Bangladesh or in Malawi, or like just imagine the CSO organization you know, accessing this resource. It's extremely technical. And also even to understand this, and I say often to a lot of my uh, uh, you know, colleagues and also the organization here, sometimes understanding GCF has to be a full-time job. You know, unless you do that, it's, it's going to be extremely uh, technical. Because apart from um, the kind of things that have been shared, even here in Nepal, 
through my organization, we try to build capacity of different stakeholders in terms of understanding the international finance, including the GCF. And for them, it's like, you know, it's, it's just too difficult. But having said that, I know, of course, we also see the opportunity that this is a new fund being created. When we had the existing funds, why did we have to have, to have this? Because there were good things about it, like uh, Thomas said earlier about the governance, you know, where you have the, uh, the developing countries would have had the chance to directly intervene and make policies, you know, that was best suited for them. You know, and based on that, they would access resources and really help the communities adapt or build resilience uh, in, in their uh, respective countries. But having said that, I think there's a, for these CSOs to go forward, there's a lot of uh, obstacles, I would say, in, in the current states. Until and unless we do, the fund really does not overcome those obstacles, many shared by uh, Thomas already, we won't be able to directly access those resources and the CSOs won't be able to do that, at least in the present context, or it'll be very technical. Like he gave the example of a few organizations, like, you know, there are six organizations Thomas mentioned, but I would even go a little further to say that I wouldn't consider IUCN or like the one from Nepal as a, as a, a, a CSO because they are uh, either intergovernmental or uh, government controlled organizations. So it means that they, are, they don't really represent the CSOs in true sense. But having said that, I think, because this comes in a, in a uh, the differences comes from the accreditation framework that the GCF employs, because it's more for the governments uh, and uh, international entities to control this process so that international organizations are only those entities that the government feel comfortable with allow them because they have a certain uh, focal point and the, uh, what do you call this, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, a, a national digital authority kind of, uh, you know, uh, provision where uh, the interface will only have to be done by the country and the fund. So there's no others can really do that apart from accessing information that's getting a little bit to know. So the, uh, the government will have to say who is going through and who is not through the, uh, the letters that they, they will have to provide which uh, Thomas earlier mentioned. So for the private sector, there's a lot of attraction in the GCF because they, it prioritizes so much because they, they, uh, they you know, bringing their own resources, there's what they call leveraging by their own resources, things like that. But for CSOs are mostly looking for grants and to, to go to the community. But of course, we have the advantage of going to the community directly, but for the private sector, it's like GCF saying, oh, maybe if we put in 1 million, they might put in $3 million and we are leveraging so much of money. So it's more on that side and trying to really look from the mitigation side where private sector would be extremely you know, uh, uh, interested in, in taking or you know, uh, covering some of their risks. So there's a facility which is there, but for, of course, for CSOs, that facility is not there. But in case uh, CSOs are stronger ones, they really wanted to get engaged with the GCF, then as Julius mentioned that through the delivery partners, they can participate, but that's only for the readiness and preparedness support program, either to prepare NAP document or to have a capacity building issues or to you know, support on a certain uh, capacity building part that the, uh, that the uh, country might want or the nationally designated authority or focal point might want. But without their uh, permission, this is also not possible. That's why like, you'll see, though there's a lot of uh, national entities, CSOs in the respective countries who could deliver this, more international entities are uh, playing part because they bundle up different countries' proposal and put it together because they think that they're stronger to deliver that. And that also really you know, hampers the uh, CSOs who could actually do that work. The other thing is about uh, how uh, one could really be participate in the uh, you know, different pro uh, pro uh, processes. Like there is a, a country ownership approach in the GCF. It means that country ownership does not really mean only the government. So it has to go beyond the gov government. It's about communities, it's about CSOs, it's about private sector, all the other actors in the country like gender uh, constituency or uh, you know, indigenous people's constituency and so on and so forth. So it, that allows a little bit of room to go forward and say that, okay, maybe we participate through this process. But again, of course, that uh, there's also gender policy, there's also this you know, uh, in, uh, indigenous people's policy that automatically demand participation of this community. But then of course, it, it, why does happen is basically because there's a specific GCF policy that demands every project pro uh, proponent to include them. But then this is also again, again contingent to where, what kind of country one comes from, because not all countries have the same level of inclusive, uh, inclusivity or participation approach or democratic values that they follow. So again, it's, it's a country to country uh, you know, based uh, approaches that, that it goes forward. So what I would say in general is there are two types of uh, participation that CSUs could do in this year. One, a direct participation. And for direct participation, there isn't a, there isn't a role uh, for now. 
unless you say that you know you go to the GCF meetings, you talk, even in the board meetings, one intervenes as a as an active CS. So that kind of intervention is there. But what I'm saying is directly accessing resources from the GCF and taking to the community is not possible in the current. So that's what I'm talking about, the direct participation. That doesn't allow. And that, that I mean, for that to happen, GCF's modality will, will have to change significantly. They'll have to make a different uh, policy decisions to go forward. But again, the indirectly, of course, they can, uh, CSOs have the uh, space to participate, whether in a project design or concept note design, whether it's a, a GCF readiness uh, pr uh, project design, or like you talk about the, you know, any implementation going on, you have a lot of interactions going at the country level. So depending on the country, that uh, indirect participation is, is allowed. But if we want to go forward, then what has to happen? I don't think it's just saying that GCF needs to do this and that is not going to help. Of course, we can give a strong message because even GCF uh, uh, informal group, a uh, CSU informal group in the GCF have been calling this for a long, long time, saying that just government accessing resources is not sufficient. Uh, the CSOs need to be allowed to uh, access these resources so that they can take directly uh, to the communities, bring back in, uh, experiences and share among a lot of other people and then really build on that. So that ask has been there for quite some time. But in order to do that, that the GCF is not sufficient, because I give you an example, if we have to give that guidance to GCF that it has to happen at the UNFCCC level as well when you do the negotiations, because the GCF being one of the operating entity of the financial mechanism of the convention, that the COP uh, gives guidance to the GCF. For instance, those people who are working on loss and damage, you will recall from COP25 that you know there was a lot of LDCs and SIDS asking the uh, uh, COP to give a guidance to uh, GCF to open a separate window for the for loss and damage, but still that didn't happen. There's so much of pressure. Why? Because those uh, countries didn't really agree. So apart from the GCF, where you make all these, you know, ask and all those capacities is there, we'll also have to work around who are the member, uh, like uh, major players in the uh, UNFCCC negotiation who can, uh, you know, be on the side of CSOs to give a guidance to say that, okay, now you also a little bit open up because I think you'll see that from loss and damage that 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 little bit was opened up. Of course, we don't have the perfect what they were asking for, but it's still that space was there. And that will be one of the entry point. But having said that, asking one of the, uh, the uh, like the, uh, you know, uh, small grant facility is an interesting idea. I think this can be floated in the UNFT negotiation or to the GCF and have that interaction. But we also have to be very clear how that functions as well. Just asking a facility, but the modality of how it works. Again, if there's a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of technicalities, as it is now, where the, the other entities and the governments are not being able to access because of those uh, lengthy process, technical process, all this assessment, then it's going to be very, very difficult. Because for now, even the micro uh, project would be like up to $10 million. And I don't think that any organization, especially in the global South would be handling even $1 million per year turnover per, uh, every year. So, I mean, that's a huge ask. So what are we asking for that? When you say we're asking for a small grant, does it mean only $50,000? Does it mean up to $500,000? How does that function? Who access that? Is it going to apply the same accreditation uh, you know, process that the GCF has currently? Or do we want to have a separate process? If that is the case, then a lot of the policy will have to be worked on so that this can be facilitated. So there are things like this that we need to uh, be you know, very clear. Of course, GCF is still in a, I would say, in a learning curve. It's learning and that's, it's modifying itself from time and again. But there's also a lot of politics as, uh, are happening. But as Leah said in outlining how the climate finance should reach to the local, all those uh, points that she raised, I think they are very critical. And in that particular context, CSOs can play a vital role in helping that, you know, in making that happen on the ground. So people in the community really feel that, you know, the re resources at the GCF level are also being reached at the local level. For, but for that, we should not just be working at the GCF level because GCF is a body that will take experiences work. But again, that, for, that force, that uh, influence has to come from the country level. So CSOs working at the country level should influence the government. Uh, of course, after that, you can also have a regional forums and experiences sharing at that level. And that collectively also influencing uh, GCF or the UNFCCC when the uh, COP takes place. And they're really giving these good examples, doing side events and really pressurizing this. Unless, and unless we don't get a good guidance, it's going to be extremely challenging. We see the opportunities where CSOs can play quite a role, but for now, as a direct participation, accessing resources and delivering to the communities is very, very challenging. So with that, I will uh, leave it here. But uh, thank you very much again. And uh, if there's any questions, I'm very happy to uh, take them. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Raj. You, you did show us that we still have a long way to go, but you've also indicated a lot of entry points despite all the challenges. This is, a, this is an opportunity for you to ask uh, questions. I actually heard that uh, the, 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 the Mentimeter or the, the online poll we use limits some questions, but we're going to post some few questions. I think we have five so far, and then the rest we're going to take from the chat. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, show you those questions as they come. So this is the first question, and this one does not have uh, a name. So I think feel free to, 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 to answer it. So would you say that the notion of country drivenness used, which usually means government driven, is also an issue that CSOs should work on by trying to expand the concept to all civil society? So the next one, This one is for Thomas. You mentioned that the current accreditation process is costly. Could you provide a little more details on this, please? For example, why is it costly? The next one. So to Thomas again, this can be the first time that the GCF has been faced with similar policy demands. What has been the GCF's reaction and what are the reason uh, the real prospects for locally led adaptation funding for the GCF. The next one is, what is the best way to become an executing entity? I assume the key challenges is to identify a relevant implementing agency and being a dialogue with them. So for now, we are going to uh, go back to the first one uh, if it's possible to answer that, and we will just scroll them down as they come. Would that be fine? So anyone, please feel free to answer the first one. I mean, I can give it a start and the others add, but in a way, Raju already answered that question in his presentation yeah. because he, um, he also made it very clear. Distinguish between country drivenness and government drivenness. And of course, the interpretation by policymakers and representatives in the GCF board, representing their government first and foremost, might always be to say, it's the government which decides what drives the country. But what is meant, you can argue, is a much wider approach. And therefore, my answer is, yes, it would be important for CSOs to include that in their lobby work and to stress the relevance of an whole of society approach. And there are some precedents in the GCF. If you look um, in the GCF, policies on indigenous peoples, they are very strong and they overrule even the concept of country drivenness being seen as driven by the government very explicitly. If you now argue that vulnerable communities as similar as indigenous people have a special status in the GCF philosophy, if you look into the guidelines and policies, then you could say, if this is the case, then vulnerable communities and their needs have to have a very strong voice as well. They drive the country and therefore you have to listen to those who represent them. So yes, uh, work on that, please. Yeah, uh, uh, Leah would like to say something, particularly on country drivenness. Please go ahead, Leah. Indeed. Um, just to reiterate what Waju and Thomas have already said, there is a difference between country and government driven. The attitudes and behaviours of groups in society, whether they're policy makers, project implementers or change agents, have direct effects on project development and implementation. But this depends as much on who is involved in the development of the project as it does on the capacity of local communities and local stakeholders to adequately engage with the project's development and implementation. 
And as well as you and Thomas have said, the GCF's process is incredibly complex and it is also something that is quite costly as well. Um, just to share that research by the Stockholm Environment Institute, SEI, shows that in addition to there being um, an impact of attitudes and behaviours, it shows that the differences in power held by stakeholders coupled with specific narratives can have an impact on the extent to which priorities and agendas are prioritised, which again can impact effective project development and implementation. Um, and just to pick up on Thomas's um, reflections on uh, uh, the, the impact of this on, on Indigenous peoples, I think it's also significant to reflect upon the fact that there are some countries that still haven't ratified certain UN conventions on the protection of Indigenous peoples, which is why it's so important that the GCF has strong social and human rights safeguards in place for all communities, including Indigenous peoples as well. Thank you for so, uh, so much, Leah. Maybe we can move on to the next uh, question that is directly to Thomas. Why is it costly? It's time consuming to develop all the papers. We have talked to a number of NGOs who started the accreditation process. One of them is still in, it's now year three and a half. And the other one decided to drop out after almost two years. And now calculate, they, we asked them how much time and they said, well, in the case of the organization which dropped out, they assumed that they had to pay um, 12 person month, full person month um, for the person who did the accreditation work. The other organization, which is still in, had after three years uh, process at least one and a half person years as staffing costs. On top of that, you need technical help. So, for example, the fiduciary standards, which are required, they are designed in a way as if you are a private sector actor or a bank, for example. To deal or to comply with these standards is relatively easy for a bank. This is bank business. It's completely different for a civil society organization. Even a big one, an international one, in its usual business has to um, fulfill different requirements. So here you need technical expertise, a lawyer, and you have to become fit for the purpose. This is only one example. Um, complaint procedures, um, social environmental safeguards, how do you handle that as an organization? These are other fields where um, the technical hurdles are high for CSOs, not because of the fact that they don't know how to manage risks, but they apply different instruments in that area than the ones required um, by the GCF. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question. Well, I think that is something you should discuss with um, CSOs that are in an observer role or also with, um, for example, I would say uh, Leah and um, in particular Raju can give their answer here as well. Um, my short answer would be yes and no. It's of course nothing completely new for GCF to face these policy demands, but there is a but. From my observer perspective, I would say um, as much as CSOs and observer CSOs to the GCF have lobbied the GCF over the last couple of years on many issues, 
direct access, but direct access for any type of implementing entity from a country of the global south, not particularly on direct access for CSOs or simplified approval, the same, a very general policy demand, but not sharpened to the specific needs of CSOs. And I would say that lobby work to provide access for CSOs to the GCF so far has not been a real priority of those CSOs who constantly lobby the GCF. But I'm sure Lea and uh, Julius and uh, Raju can contribute to that discussion. As yeah, well. I, will, I will just uh, come here very briefly. I got two things that I wanted to mention, even the one, the former uh, question that I wanted to come back on. And uh, Anika had a question uh, uh, on also on the EDA part, so which I will try and respond to that as well. It was very much linked to this. The interesting uh, fact is that, you know, in order to be, uh, uh, well, let me give an example because my, I had a very short time in, uh, in my presentation. So I, I, was, I hurried a little bit. If you see how the way the CSOs can actually get engaged in the, uh, as an executing entity or, or be a part of the project proposal is in Nepal, what, what was the case was whenever the government wanted to collect, uh, you know, concept notes, it made an announcement in the newspaper, in the public, you know, National Daily, and they said, Whoever organize, whichever organizations want to have a, a proposal to the GCF, please, based on this certain format, you uh, put in a, a funding proposal uh, or a concept, I would say. Then, but then there was a condition. They said, first, find and execute, I mean, uh, and, uh, find and um, uh, execute an entity. So you'll have to find who are you going to carry your project through. Second, you'll have to, have to find an implementing entity that's the government related. So because it's a government project, a ministry or somebody will have to carry that. So it means that what happened was quite a few organizations got together, put their thoughts together and built on a project proposal. And then through the uh, 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 accredited entity, they put into the government or with the letter from the one of the ministries. It meant that now there was already who wanted to be an executing entity in terms of uh, taking that project forward in the future was already identified. That really helped. There was a participatory process. People could brought, uh, you know, uh, thinking could be brought together and that's how the project was developed. And then the government uh, you know, had a criteria to rank them and gave the authority for the uh, executing, uh, I mean, uh, executed entity. And that is how our two proposal that went to the GCF got through. Now, this is a, one of the very good practice. And there's another example similarly now, even indigenous peoples are building, they're finding an accredited entity, they're working with them, they're going to the grassroots level, they're spending some money to do the consultations with those uh, indigenous peoples and, and making a, funding proposal. I think that's also a good way. In the future, when you get that particular project, those will be the same entities will be executing. I mean, it might take a couple of years or some time unless the project comes, but once it says comes, they're also part of it. So either you can choose to make the GCF better by giving examples or directly getting involved and then implementing it. But of course, in order to do this further, uh, you know, make the organization locally accessible, there was a concept called ED, Enhanced Direct Access which Adaptation Fund also employed, and that the same experiences was, uh, was uh, trying to uh, like bring to GCF. But unfortunately, this couldn't fly too much in the GCF for various reasons. And you know, the board of the GCF also set aside $200 million for the piloting. They would give up to 20, uh, 20 million per uh, entity to take this, which literally meant that not every project would be decided by the GCF, but there would be a bundling of the projects that one of the activity entity would carry but then later on, based on that, it would be a program. And in order to carry that project program forward, there would be different projects. So, so the local organization could actually write a project proposal, take a certain amount of that money, and then implement it. It means that it was more of a, not just direct access, but enhanced direct access where the country ownership, participation of local entities, you know, that was more a strong aspect of that. But of course, as I said, it didn't fly too much because there was a lot of uh, complications with the programming and things like that. But that is one of the things where if you cannot write a, you know, a $10 million project or a $5 million project under the micro, you could even write half a million dollar or $200,000 if that EDA was a part of that. And every organization, wherever we're deliberating and had experience of that sort, who made that certain standards of fiduciary risk, 
they would be able to carry those projects and help implement. I think that would be an excellent idea, even for uh, poorer countries, uh, countries with you know smaller organizations where institutes are not very well built. For them, that would be an excellent opportunity to to go forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would like us to move on to another question uh, so that we can try to answer as many as possible. And also let's keep our uh, responses short. Uh, here's another one. What's the best way to become an executing entity? If I can give it a start, the, the most important step is that you first make a national stakeholder mapping because there is not one answer to that but the right answer to that is highly dependent on the country and how the, if there is a um, national implementing entity, if this, if there is one, is it open to you or not? And that you have um, to study first, but in good practice cases, and I would like to mention Bangladesh as a positive case, here it is in fact the case that um, the national implementing entities are open to receive proposals, placed to them in a proactive way by national actors. While there are other countries, and then you as an executing entity should just identify that um, if there is an opportunity and if so, be proactive and present something where you feel you are the best at. And everything related to projects with a focus on indigenous communities and also projects with a focus on locally led, um, locally led um, adaptation may have particular opportunities now. In other countries, um, the situation is different. And here you may even face a situation where the implementing entity is not ready to receive any proactive uh, suggestion of an executive, executing entity, but considers executing entities as service deliverers, where they would then ask you whether you are ready uh, to work with them. So, look at the national circumstances first and then design your strategy. Thank you so much. I mean, yeah. If I may, um, yeah. but I think it's uh, important to highlight that um, there's a, a discrimination in the sense that it's local civil society do not have direct access to the GCF, but you have organizations um, like WWF that are listed as accredited entities and that have master agreements between themselves and the, the GCF, which means that if you are a, a large um, civil society organization, you, you have that opportunity, which isn't isn't fair to those locally led organizations. I would also um, to add to what Thomas has just said about doing a stakeholder mapping. It's also really important to carry out a gender analysis in order to determine the differing needs and interests in a society, but also to determine the differing um, accessibility to financial mechanisms, as, um, as was said previously, the financial mechanisms that local communities have are sometimes different to the ones that the, the GCF is um, dispersing finance through. However, access to those finance mechanisms isn't the same across uh, gender, gender lines. Um, and a gender analysis is also useful to help determine the power dynamics within an organization um, and to help understand the intersectionality of, of, of gender inequality within a community as well. Um, thanks. Thank you so much, Leah. We can move on to another question. So this one goes to Thomas. So um, if you would like to give it a go. Well, if you want to raise the question whether the GCF is a highly politicized funding channel, then the answer is clearly yes. And that makes it so complicated. There is nothing easy within GCF, not even things 
that could be dealt with easily are easy in reality. Um, but maybe I also now hand over again to Raju, who has um, very uh, well, due to his position, lots of insights, and maybe you want to reflect on the question of power relations as well. Yes, just very briefly on this, uh, I, I think you said it very rightly. Yes, it is a, it is a very uh, a power play does uh, happen there. And it's uh, like what you have, if you have been following the UNFCCC process, I think it's the spillover of that effect that also is seen in the this year because the members, board members are chosen through the UNFCCC process. And then that's how it, uh, it goes. But having said that, if you would like to really experience the first time experience and you have not attended any of the Green Climate uh, Fund board meetings, uh, you'll have, you can, I mean, in the next meeting, you can uh, be a participant observe because they're live streamed, or you can also go visit the uh, website of the GCF and see how this is uh, taken in certain issues and how the power plays really takes place. And not necessarily just because you hand in uh, the project proposal, it means that you automatically get it. Uh, get it. This is also for the project uh, proposal and it's also for the accredited entities. Just imagine, uh, now we already have about 103 uh, uh, entities uh, being accredited with the GCF. And in the last, if the last board meeting uh, really approved it, it would be additional six modes. But it means that GCF cannot continue to add these accredited entities because why do, why do any entity get accredited with the GCF? It basically to access resources and take it on the ground, right? So it cannot just have a lot of, lot of uh, entities. At some point of time, this will come to an end. It'll have to, it'll have, to have a cap and not allow to really have a lot of the entities or hundreds and thousands of entities coming and accredited with the GCF. So it means that at some point, really cap. But for CSOs to really get in, it can have a provision because even if it's caps for the uh, international entities and the, uh, you, what do you call this, other organization, uh, government owned organization or national DAs, it can have a different provision for the CSOs, like the way what Thomas earlier proposed for uh, the facility for CSOs. But this is highly political because even there are lots of governments who don't want many entities to come in and just the resources being spread out. You know, even they are very, tech, you know, uh, not just for the, uh, I think it's all the board members are all mindful of that, that, that the resources cannot be just uh, spread out to waiver is uh, taking the resources. So, it also, so that's why I said in my intervention, the lobby has to be at the national level, how the, your country sees CSOs at the local level, and then how the country carries the, that issue at the UNFCCC at the GCF level, and how that is being discussed. I think that, that dynamic is a very, very key factor, and only that will determine how it goes further. Otherwise, in this politics, uh, small organization or CSOs are going to be crushed like, like in the GCF process, like anything. Okay, thank you so much, Raju. Uh, let's go to the next question, and I think there are two questions that were not uh, uh, displayed on this in the screen. So also anyone who'd like, especially anyone who might have not spoken to talk about this. Next question. All right, thank you. Uh, let me start. Um, I think I also raised this in, in, in my presentation on how CSOs can enhance their capacity in developing concept notes. Um, um, I think there is, uh, there are two or three ways about it, uh, just to be in sh short. Uh, first one is to make sure that CSOs uh, uh, would uh, understand, have to actually uh, make sure that they understand the GCF process the way it is and how it behaves so that uh, they can, uh, whatever proposals that can be, uh, you know, uh, preparing can be responding to uh, the needs uh, uh, that, that are there, the policy demands, but also the objectives of the fund itself. So um, uh, capacity building, uh, whether um, uh, in, in, in any way should actually make sure that civil society are actually uh, um, um, answering to those uh, demands. Otherwise, there'll be a lot of uh, processes uh, back and forth for you to actually complete a certain uh, proposal development, uh, you know, and, and submit the pro proposals. Uh, there are so many uh, of these um, uh, webinars that are ongoing, um, a country uh, is, uh, uh, you know, driven kind of webinars, but also, you know, at international level, there are so many of these discussions that are ongoing on how, uh, you know, uh, civil society can play a role, can develop uh, bankable proposals, 
uh, it's very important that uh, uh, we have this uh, civil society participating in all these webinars, but even also specialized a kind of training in terms of how to develop proposals. I think it's very important so that at least uh, the proposals that can be submitted to the GCF should be uh, those that are you know, highly technical, but also having a lot of information that can uh, assist the board to actually not delay the process of approving them. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. There are only two more questions and one relates to what you just said, uh, Julius, about bankability of projects. So the question is how can we bring the adaptation intervention in a GCF project in terms of bank bankable perspective? That's one question we have from the floor. And a final question for the days from Gideon, who says the greatest challenges we are facing as CSOs and indigenous organizations are access to an in effective particip participation on dialogues and discussions with our NDAs. It is even easier to meet with uh, accredited entities than NDAs in our countries, especially in African countries. So what actions should we take should be taken by the GCF to ensure that NDAs would cooperate with CSOs in their countries? That's a question. I think those are the two main questions. And afterwards, I'm going to ask you to just wrap up, give us your final words, and we will wrap up uh, for the day. Thank you, anyone can take the two questions. On the question of the NDAs, I think it's very important that uh, 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 countries, especially uh, the um, different um, institutions that are leading uh, GCF processes in different countries understand what, uh, the, what it means to say an NDA. I think we've had uh, a lot of debate within the civil society to say uh, other countries don't really understand what an NDA is, whether it's a person, whether it's an institution, uh, um, uh, but that is a very, very, um, you know, fundamental question that we need to, uh, not need to be actually analyzed. And if we understand that, I think it would be very uh, good. I mean, I mean, moving forward, it is to be very easy for actually the NDAs, whether uh, which are supposed to be institutions in the country, to steer the processes within the country. We're bringing all stakeholders uh, uh, together, uh, having uh, uh, different, you know. Uh, and elaborate uh, protocols that can uh, take into consideration different stakeholders, including civil society, to play different roles in the different uh, uh, in the GCF processes. Yes, uh, just to add uh, a sentence on that, I would agree with Julius. But uh, again, the problem also is with with, with the NDR focal point is sometimes the people sitting there are continually changing after some time, so they'll have to. I know, uh, know about the GCF process again and again. So this is a quite a difficult challenge. So in order to even to avoid that, or let's say what one can do is not just depend on the ND or focal uh, uh, point, but also depend on the uh, international entity because when the accreditation process is done, there is a very rigorous process uh, of the fiduciary standards, social and environmental safeguards, gender policy, all this being assessed of the accredited entity. So they are responsible to implement these policies that the GCF has. So they have the responsibility as well. So it's always good to get to them. And of course, ensuring that uh, whenever there is a project proposal being uh, put forward and then to ensure their way that that component, because you have to have a very specific answers in the proposal that all these people are, I mean, discussed or I'm sorry, the uh, uh, interacted with and their the opinions are also reflected and so on and so forth. So I mean, to check that would be very helpful. If I can, if I can briefly yes. add to that. Um, Again, here, I would say, check the specific situation in your country. Formally, the role of NDAs is defined. And formally, if it is about country programming, NDAs are required by the GCF to include all stakeholders from the very beginning. And that includes, of course, civil society. So you have a right to be on board and that can provide an argument to you. And now comes a but. If the NDA really plays that role that it should play according um, to the statutes is a different question. And there are countries where um, national implementing entities de facto take the role which the NDA should have. And then it's more important to, um, to work with uh, the national implementing entity. And then there are countries 
as Raju flagged out, where it might be more important and um, more relevant to engage with an international implementing entity, which has an um, open approach on civil society actors. And finally, then there might be the situation, and we had one case, I cannot uh, say which country it was, where neither the NDA nor the, uh, nor the national implementing entity finally had the say, but it was just another governmental authority. So if you want to engage with GCF, first check very clearly what is the specific situation in your country. And only then you can navigate without uh, losing a lot of time. And on the second question, I think bankable projects on adaptation are always possible. And um, there is pressure on the GCF to deliver more adaptation projects because of the fact that there should be a 50-50% balance, but the reality is more or less 78% uh, mitigation and only 22% plus minus adaptation projects. So there is pressure, political pressure on the GCF to fill up its project pipeline with adaptation projects, and that should provide opportunities for you. And with that, uh, there's need for a lot of, um, you know, the countries to actually make deliberate efforts to generate a lot of data, um, um, uh, come up with the, you know, uh, clear um, uh, uh, indicators, uh, adaptation indicators, but also uh, make sure that they are defining their own uh, um, uh, projects at the beginning, making sure that there's um, you know, clear uh, climate rationale uh, to, to, to the different uh, contexts that they, the proposal wants to take in terms of uh, maybe uh, adaptation related interventions. Thank you. Then final words, final words. Leah, any few words that you'd like to give to anyone before we wrap up? Just to say that all of the discussions today show that there is a clear and urgent need for there to be a predictable stream of climate finance and that there needs to be greater access to climate finance, uh, not just at a country level, but also for those within vulnerable climate vulnerable communities. Um, I encourage everyone to look at the different reports that have been raised today and to reach out with any questions regarding how to um, increase their, their ability to uh, engage in project development and implementation. And to say thank you to Sidse for welcoming me on today's webinar. Thank you so much. Thomas, 30 seconds, final words. Three sentences. One, to correct myself, the figures I presented on the balance between adaptation and mitigation were wrong. I mixed it up, it's more 60%, 40%. Second statement, as, an, as a small organization which is interested um, in climate finance, don't focus alone on the GCF. It's the highest hanging fruit and there are many more other opportunities which you should explore. Third sentence, despite that, I would strongly encourage CSOs to look for ways and to lobby the GCF in a way that more civil society organizations become partners by having projects funded by the GCF. Being observer means you are standing at the sidelines and you can comment, but you can hardly change the game. If you want to make the GCF to deliver according to its vision, transformative projects, then you should become a partner and change the system from inside. Thank you so much, Thomas. Raju, your final words. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, very briefly, I would just say that, you know, um, it may be in the, in the short run, it may be very difficult to access resources from, uh, from the GCF uh, for the CSOs. Of course, this fight has to continue how we get uh, engaged more actively. But at the same time, we should make best use of these uh, potential indirect participation that CSOs can have, either in designing a project, either in implementing the project, or in capacity building or sharing information, like the way you, such has been doing 
you know, and there are a lot of things we can also do outside because the objective is just not to get uh, resources by ourselves, but also to see that whether the communities on the ground are actually being uh, are benefited or not, whether they get the resources to the government mechanism or international mechanism, but ensuring that the vulnerable people, poor people, and the needy ones are actually being served by the climate uh, green uh, climate fund is very very key. So in the in the short run. We focus on these kind of work, but in the long run, we also see how we access ourselves and then deliver those. And I, I completely agree with the suggestion that uh, um, Thomas made. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raju. Julius, also very quick, wait in 30 minutes. What are your final words to everybody who's listening in? Yeah, the, the, the road is still muddy uh, in terms of um, uh, wanting to, for CSOs to access uh, GCF resources, especially directly, but uh, the, that requires um, us to still do more lobbying uh, for, for civil society, but also uh, as we are doing the lobbying, we also need to um, um, you know, um, uh, make sure that we are capacitating ourselves and uh, putting ourselves in a situation where we can really uh, access the resources and deliver at the end of the day. Otherwise, I thank you so much for taking into consideration uh, that I should be part of this and uh, happy to share more information uh, when need be. Thank you so much, colleagues. Thank you. Uh, just to wrap up, uh, Chloe, our colleagues, will be just sharing out a few, a, a few key points, uh, but very, very, very briefly um, at the end. Uh, Chloe, please uh, give us a summary of what we spoke about today. Well, I took many notes, but I will just keep it brief that I think the biggest takeaway I heard is needing to have more democratic processes and whether that's a redefining or better understanding of the role of um, the national designated um, uh, entity in the process, the NDA, um, whether that's a better understanding of what country ownership of a project really means. Um, I thought that the comment that Julius made about um, even how civil society itself operates and this idea that there needs to be more collaboration within civil society itself if they're going to gain access on the ground. Um, and again, just on another point of democracy, the, the role that CSOs are playing in lobbying at the, at the board level needs to be to create more space for civil society on the ground um, and more opportunities for them to access um, the funding. And um, I think I will just wrap it up with there. There was a great discussion there, but I'm supposed to keep it brief. So that would be the top line takeaway is, is creating more democratic space um, and more collaboration among both civil society as well as um, the accredited entities, government, that it needs to be a whole of country approach and that there's also a role for the international community to play in making that possible. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much to all our panelists, for all our, those who attended. Thank you so much for this amazing time and also my colleagues in the background for, for joining us today. We are going to take a, uh, some of the recommendations actually, most of the recommendations into action. So any person who is interested in joining us uh, sits say uh, in some of the activities that would like to follow up beyond this uh, seminar, please feel free to write your email and name in the chat so that we can follow up. Or you can also share your, uh, let me say, you can contact us through some of the contact details I will share with you right at the end. So when we close, I will leave a screen with uh, Thomas's contacts and my contacts and you can get hold of us afterwards. So thank you so much for your participation. May you do enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you and goodbye.